I feel very confident inflation is coming in. So I don't think they should raise rates at this point. They don't need to raise rates. I don't think they will, but I say that they've done things that I don't think they should have done. I don't, those last 50 basis points in rate hikes, I don't think they needed to do. They certainly don't do, need to go any further from this point, given what we know and given how things are playing out here. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good morning, everyone. I'm out on the West Coast, and so it is still very much morning uh, for me on this Wednesday. Uh, and it is a real pleasure to have my friend uh, for Mark. It, it's now yeah. becoming many, many years. I'm, many uh, years, I'm, decades. I'm trying to hold off on the decades worth of friendship that we have. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it, it's great. I know we've got a ton of people signed up to hear your thoughts uh, on the markets and, and what's happening today. And I I will say at the top, Mark, in going back and doing research for this webcast, I got to watch a lot of your public statements on CNBC, particularly over the last year, two years, even I went back four or five years to take oh, a look no. at it. Yeah, no, it was actually, it was really interesting to look back at the economy pre-pandemic right. and what your thoughts were as it relates to where we were heading, right. as it relates to a potential recession back in 2019, heading into 2020, and little did we all know it was coming around the corner. Uh, but, I, but I will say that you've been extremely prescient as it relates to a recession uh, or not, as the case might be. Um, and you, you, you pin that view and coming out saying that the United States likely would avoid a recession on a number of different factors that I want to talk about in a moment. But I want to talk with the, with the most, I guess, the biggest headline of the last 24 hours, which was the downgrade of the U.S. debt uh, by Fitch. Uh, Moody's is now the only outstanding rating agency with a AAA rating on U.S. debt. Uh, after S&P lowered their rating of the U.S. in 2011. And obviously, the 10-year has it, it tightened by two basis points right when the news came out, and then it's now gapped out by, last I looked at it, um, five to 10 basis points on the day. What are the implications, Mark, long-term to this downgrade by Fitch? Uh, well, uh, Willie, it's great to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I uh, appreciate the friendship over the years, and I think decades. I can remember one event or uh, way back when on Nantucket or something. And then I can't remember where it was. I had to Chatham bars in. Chatham oh, is that what in. it was? Ch oh yeah. Chatham's bars in. That was it. That was it. Yeah. It was a, that was a great, great venue. Uh, well, that was a really a lot of fun, but I really appreciate your friendship and the support. Um, and I should say just as a preface, uh, I am the chief economist of, of Moody's uh, analytics I am not in the rating agency, so I, I'm not speaking for the rating agency. Um, this is just Mark Zandi speaking to you. Uh, and um, I, I should also say I'm on the board of directors of MGIC, just uh, for sake of disclosure, I'm on the um, uh, the, the private mortgage insurer. Um, I don't think the Fitch rating downgrade means anything, Willie. Uh, I think uh, there's no new news. Uh, uh, I don't think it's going to affect or change the minds of global investors in any meaningful way. I mean, at the end of the day, the U.S. is still the AAA credit on the planet. Whether they have a AAA rating by Fitch or not, push comes to shove if something's going wrong in the global economy, something's going wrong here in the United States of America, uh, money comes here uh, because uh, global investors know that it's money good, that if they buy a treasury bond, that they will uh, get their money back uh, principal and interest in a, in a timely way. Um, and that's not to say we don't have our fiscal issues. It's not to say our politics uh, aren't problematic. Uh, they are. Uh, but I will say uh, we've uh, had all kinds of fiscal challenges since the inception of the nation, uh, many political challenges since the inception of the nation, and we've always made good on our debt. And there's no reason to suspect that that won't remain the case going forward. Uh, we will, you know, at some point here in the not too distant future, probably after the next election, I suspect uh, the, the, a lot of things are coming together where uh, we'll make, uh, you know, I think uh, some significant um, 
uh, progress in addressing our long-term fiscal issues, and both on the tax side and on the spending side. So I, I don't think there's any consequence to this. And this, the market reaction we're observing now, there's, you know, the initial reaction was yields were down, not up. I mean, there's a lot right. that happened since then. So I don't think I'd read anything in, in terms of where the 10-year yield sits at this point in time. Help me foot that comment with your consistent statements over the last year that the U.S. wouldn't go into a recession. And one of the main reasons for that is consumer confidence. In other words, I've, I've listened to you and it's been, it's been fascinating to hear you basically say, look, recessions happen when people lose confidence in the economy. And when they pull back, the economy goes into recession. And so as long as there is consumer confidence, you will continue to move through and not have it. And you've got more specific points below that that I want to dive into a minute. But just as it relates to the downgrade by Fitch, I'm surprised that you don't think that that adds another sort of chink in the armor of confidence in U.S. debt that could have longer term implications to it. Why? No. Why is consumer confidence so important to holding up the economy on one side, if you will, on the equity markets and on GDP growth? And yet on the debt side, we can still sit there and say, we're OK. This doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, the average American doesn't even fit, fit ratings. What? <laughs> What's all that mean? Uh, I, I, that, you know, uh, and, at the, and that's what we're really talking about when it comes down to recession. I mean, recession is at core, a loss of faith. You know, consumers lose faith that they're going to hold on to their job and they start pulling back on their spending. They run for the bunker. A loss of faith by business people that they're going to be able to sell what it, whatever it is that they produce and they start laying off workers and you get into this kind of self-reinforcing negative cycle. Uh, no evidence of that uh, at this point. Um, I mean, I there are different measures of sentiment, consumer sentiment. I find the most prescient to be the measure from the conference board is a monthly survey that actually rose very strongly last month and is well now at this point well above its long run historical average so no sign at all that you know consumers are on the edge of of uh, uh, packing it in and i don't think this downgrade or the debt situation which is you know nothing changed between today and yesterday and the day before and a week ago and a month ago I don't think that's going to have an impact on people's thinking about, you know, their job, uh, you know, uh, their finances, uh, you know, the stock market, their housing values, all the things that really, the, what's the price of a gallon of regular unleaded, you know, those things people know, and that's what drives sentiment, not not a downgrade, not concerns about deficits or debt, at least not at this point. And just as it relates to sort of the amount of debt outstanding at the federal government and kind of net net debt back of the envelope and correct me if my math is wrong here versus, if you will, your both very deep understanding of it as well as your real math, uh, about 32 trillion of federal debt outstanding. But if you back out sort of intergovernmental debt hold, as well as the debt sitting at the Fed, that 32 trillion turns into about 18 trillion of kind of net net debt out to both Americans and foreign governments as it relates to real obligations of the of, of the US Treasury. Does either the aggregate number of 32 trillion or the 18 trillion of net net debt concern you as it relates to the overall fiscal situation of our of our country? Or should we be looking at it sort of like a debt service coverage ratio of, you know, you got 23 trillion of GDP and you've got X coming into the federal government every year and they've got plenty of cash flow to be able to service the debt. So there's absolutely nothing to really worry about there. Yeah. At this point in time, I, I don't think the debt load is a, a, a problem for the economy. You know, the best measure, I think, is publicly traded treasury debt to GDP. That is a close to 100%, you know, that's, I wish it were lower. It you know, certainly has been driven up for some good reasons, some bad reasons, you know, good reasons being pandemic, bad reason being, you know, you know, massive tax cuts and significant increases in spending. You know, it's not ideally where you'd want it, but I don't think it's a issue for the economy's performance at this point in time. Having said that, uh, you know, take just all you do is crack open uh, the the outlook for our uh, budget as done by the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, the nonpartisan budgeteers. And if we don't change policy, if we don't change tax policy, if we don't change spending policy, 10 years from now, that's going to be 120% of GDP, you know? And the tra trajectory after that is 
you know, straight up. And then what happens is at a at a point in time, in the not too distant future, you know, not next year, but you know, a decade from now, you know, the debt, uh, the interest payments on that debt become consequential, and it starts adding to the deficits and debt, and you get into this kind of self reinforcing negative dynamic, which we do not want to get into. And at some point, it's going to be a problem, and it will manifest in the form of much higher interest rates, kind of sort of like we were in this situation back in the early 90s, Clinton and the Gingrich came together and did uh, what they needed to do. And they put the ship, you know, back on, on the, the, the train back on the tracks. Uh, we're gonna have to do the same thing. So I, I don't, I'm not worried about what the deficit debt mean for the economy today, but I do worry about what it means going forward. We do need to make changes uh, in our both tax and spending policy to address those, to get our long-term fiscal situation on a more sustainable path. So we've got some hard work to do. My sense is that probably first step in that process will be early 2025 on the other side of the election. Because as I mentioned earlier, a bunch of stuff is coming together. Of, you know, we got to raise the debt limit again. The Trump tax cuts for high-income households, they expire you know, in 2025. There's a bunch of uh, spending related to Obamacare that you know has to be renewed uh, by legislation in early 2025. So there's a lot of reasons to think that that's going to be a forcing a point forcing point in time for us to address our long-term problems. And if we have this conversation circa 2026 or 2027, if you know if I'm still around, <laughs> I was just going to say I, I hope we're still around. Still what we're doing in, in 2026. Yeah. Seven. And we haven't addressed it, then then I might be singing a different tune. But at this point, I, I feel like uh, not not an issue, uh, not not a significant issue. We got other we got other bigger problems at the moment. Yeah, you point out, Mark, though that you you went back to Clinton Gingrich, and I do think that many people forget that from ninety five to two thousand, the Fed funds rate sat in a band of I think it was five percent to six twenty five is the band that the Fed funds rate was in for that period of time, hmm. and I think after having been in such a low rate environment for so long, many people kind of forget that yeah. a having a Fed funds rate at zero is unprecedented, but we've hmm. all gotten kind of used to it. But that the economy did exceptionally well from ninety five to two thousand. We actually balanced the budget with a Fed funds rate where it was between five percent and six twenty five, and so that these aren't sort of uncharted territories as we mm. see the Fed funds rate go up to five twenty five. Great, I'm very impressed. That I, if you had asked me what was the average funds rate between nineteen ninety five and two thousand, I don't think I'd have gotten that right. But that that's pretty cool. But you, you're pretty nerdy, nerdier than I am. I think. Uh, uh, the, uh, so I take I take that's a, that's a big compliment. Um, but that's not the, <laughs> the reason I raised that was just. I mean, I, I do think that there's this sense that we kind of are in uncharted territories as oh. it relates to what the Fed has done. And we, we just aren't. We aren't. Although the, the other thing that I thought was, as I went back and looked and got prepared for this, Mark, one of the other things that I keep hearing that this has been an unprecedented, if you will, rising cycle, that it's moved faster, quicker than ever before. But if you go back and look at what Paul Volcker did in 1980, uh, between July of 1980 and December of 1980, the Fed funds rate went from, I think it was 9% up to 18%. I mean, they put 900 basis points into the Fed funds rate over that period of time. Right. Um, and so while this all, the adjustment is so difficult for people, and particularly in the commercial real estate industry, as it relates to this adjustment and what it means for your debt service and your debt service coverage and things of that nature, we aren't sort of with a Fed funds rate at 525 and a 10-year at 4 we're sort of in a normalized cost of debt capital market that it just happens to be that for the last 12 years or so, we've been in this sort of, you know, zero interest rate environment. Yeah, I, I, I would certainly on the long end, you know, a 10 year treasury yield sitting around four, that feels like we should get used to that because that's kind of where it should be uh, in, a, in the long run, abstracting from the ups and downs in the economy and in the business cycle. That goes to the, kind of the uh, way of thinking about my intuition, easy intuition is that in the long run, the 10 year yield should equal the nominal potential growth rate of the economy or nominal GDP growth. And that's four, 2% real potential plus 2% inflation is four. So we're in, on the long end, I feel like we're close to where we're gonna be, give or take, you know, going forward. Short end, obviously uh, that needs to write itself. So the five and a quarter, five and a half percent funds rate is intentionally restrictive. As a, high 
in an effort to slow the economy's growth and quell inflation. And that's working, you know, reasonably so. And that feels like to me by this time next year, inflation will be in sufficiently that the Fed will say, okay, you know, I've done my uh, work and I'm going to start lowering interest rates slowly at first. I don't think they're going to move quickly. And I don't think they'll have to because the economy won't be in recession. But by kind of mid-decade, end of 2025, going into 26, we should be a funds rate target that's two and a half, two and three quarters, something like that. This, that's what economists call the uh, R star, the equilibrium rate. You know, pol uh, that's the rate where policy, monetary policy is neither supporting economic growth or uh, weighing against it. It's kind of neutral. Uh, but that would be normal. That's where I think, you know, in the long run, we need to, we will be where we should be. 4% 10 year yield, 2.5% funds rate target, 150 basis point spread between the two is kind of, if you do the arithmetic, the long run historical average. So I went back and looked at uh, an interview you did on CNBC back in October. Okay. And at that time, you said, yeah, I mean, maybe the Fed does 75 basis points in November, 50 basis points in December, 25 in January, and then they're out. And, uh, you know, oh, 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 if we'd only gone down that path, um, we would have we would have avoided a, a significant amount of pain. But you've been calling for a while, Mark, for the Fed to stop tightening and to stop raising rates. Um, what right now, given where we are and their pause and then 25 basis points, What's your thought as it relates to future Fed rate increases? Do we have another one between now and the end of the year? Do you think they have to keep tightening even further, given your read on inflationary pressures and what the Fed has said? What should people be thinking as it relates to where the Fed funds rate goes over the next five months? Yeah, you know, forecasting the funds rate, it's, it gets a little difficult when there's a, a, a difference between what you think they should do and what they will do. Yeah. <laughs> I clearly thought back then that, you know, they they don't need to raise rates to five and a quarter or five and a half percent to get the job done, to get slow growth sufficiently to get inflation. Because in my view, the inflation that we're suffering from is largely due to the supply shocks created by the pandemic and the Russian war and the conflation of those two things in inflation expectations. And as the pandemic and the Russian war effects go further back into the rearview mirror, inflation will moderate. And we don't need High, much higher interest rates. We don't need to push the economy into recession to get that inflation back in, and that feels like what's happening now. The, 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 you know, feels we we've inflation's come in quite dramatically. All the trend lines look very good, but yet the unemployment rate is still. We'll get another read on Friday, but it's three and a half percent. It hasn't budged in 12, 18 months. So, you know, I just don't think they needed to raise rates, and at this point, they definitely do not need to raise interest rates. Uh, the, this should be the end of the story. The other thing that you know, I found a bit perplexing in, in the context of what they should do and what they would do, on, on the should side, I, you know, I do think the stress the banking system and the financial system more broadly or under are consequential. And that obviously boiled over back in March and required a pretty aggressive policy response. The Fed had to step in, the FDIC had to step in, the Treasury had to step in to quell the crisis. But, you know, the tensions, the the kind of the reasons for why the banking system got into trouble, they haven't gone away. And it goes back to the yield curve, the inversion of the curve and the effects that's having on their, their operating environment, their net interest margin. So, you know, I view that as a significant risk or threat to my optimism about the economy that, you know, that they keep putting pressure on the system. If they certainly if they raise, continue to raise rates and cause the curve to go even more inverted that at some point they're going to break something that they're not going to be able to fix, you know, quickly. And we will go into recession. And again, why? You know, because inflation is coming in. It's doing exactly what you would want it to do. And again, all the trend lines, you know, uh, Willie, I forecast lots of stuff. Uh, you know, some <laughs> stuff I feel very confident in, not some not so much. The, the outlook for inflation coming in more, I feel very confident. in. It's coming in because I know vehicle prices are going to decline I know the cost of housing services are going to decline because of rent growth, which we're going to come back to. I know, I know that electricity prices are going to come in. You know, some there can be some spanners, you know, and that create some problems. You know, oil prices can jump and so forth and so on. But I feel very confident inflation is coming in. So I don't think they should raise rates at this point. They don't need to raise rates. I don't think they will. But I say that you know they're you know they 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 have. 
They've done things that I don't think they should have done. I don't, those last 50 basis points and rate hikes, I don't think they needed to do. They certainly don't do, need to go any further from, from this case, this point, given what we know and given how things are playing out here. So there's a, there's a bunch in there that I'd love to kind of double click on as it relates to all of those component parts, but let's start here on the, on the banking sector. Um, how sensitive to do further rate increases do you feel the banking sector is to the degree that um, if they don't raise again, is it your view that banking sector has avoided and, and averted a meltdown and a crisis that we clearly saw happen in Q2 of 2023 and that the overcapitalization of the banking system, while there clearly could be a small bank that goes under just for poor management and other issues, but would you say that if you added, is there any sensitivity analysis that you and your team have done as it relates to, you know, you add another 50 basis points or another 75 basis points to the Fed funds rate, and there are some banks that start to really tip upside down, given being upside down on, on their balance sheets. Um, is, it, is it that sensitive or is it more of a general view on the banking sector that it just can't, it can't afford a whole lot more? Yeah, I think the system is under a lot of pressure. Uh, and, you know, for the moment, it's stable because of the policy response, the bank term funding program that FD, the Fed set up. And if you look at that every week, it, you know, it increases, not, not by tens of billions, but by billions. So that means that banks are borrowing against their security holdings at par in that program, and they need to do that. Uh, that's not a good sign. You want you'd want to see that coming in. So the system, in my view, is under a lot of pressure. It can can manage through if the Fed doesn't continue to raise rates, uh, and uh, inflation comes in, and the cur and the Fed starts easing policy by this time next year. If they have to raise rates further or feel like they do, and or they keep rates elevated for an extended period, you know, more than the next six, nine, 12 months, they take it all the way through into 24, 25, then the banks are going to run into a situation where they can't manage it. Right now, they're kind of managing the curve. They're keeping their net interest margin stable through hedging and matching. I mean, go take a look at JP Morgan's uh, NIM, net interest margin last quarter. I'm making this up, but roughly speaking, 280 basis points. It was 280 basis points the quarter before and the quarter before that. So they, they're able to manage it. But over time, if the curve stays flat to inverted, certainly if they keep raising rates and the curve gets even more inverted, you know, given all the other things that they have to deal with, then I think it's going to become increasingly difficult. Something else is going to break. And the, the next time it breaks, it, it may not be, it, there may not be a, a quick fix, particularly... Here's the other thing, Willie. You know, we're focused on the banking system, but there's this thing called the shadow bank system out there. The other, they, you know, half the credit that's provided to the economy comes from banks, half come from, you know, uh, consumer finance companies or independent mortgage banks, uh, REITs, uh, pension funds, hedge funds, sovereign wealth, you know, a whole private equity for a whole melange of stuff. There's a lot of stress going on out there too. And it, what makes it even more nerve wracking is it's not transparent, thus the moniker shadow system. And if it's opaque, then it's much more likely to experience some kind of funding run that the sources of funding will say, oh, I don't really understand what's going on here. So I'm going to paint everyone with the same brush and I'm going to stop funding. And you get, it's like a bank run in the shadow system. Then the question is, well, how does the Fed respond to that? You know, you know what tools do they have for, for addressing that? So my, my, my broader point is, I think the system can di can manage through with where we are. If if inflation comes in as I expect, and they're allowed to start, and they're in a position where they can start easing policy by this time next year, I think we're good. We're, you know, we're, we're going to get through. But you know, if they keep raising rates for whatever reason, or if they may continue to uh, maintain this very tight policy for more than a year, goes goes into late next year into 2025, I fear something will break somewhere and you know then we'll go into recession then they'll be scrambling it's a really interesting point as it relates to the shadow banking system mark and and and, and credit providers um, i had mark lipschultz the ceo of blue owl on the webcast last week and mark and i talked about how blue owl has capitalized on the growth in private credit um and uh, i we we talked about a, a chart from their annual report which just shows the number of 
public companies out there and then the number of portfolio companies and private equity firm portfolios and the two charts just completely cross one another that uh, it, back in 2000 you had the you know you had 10,000 publicly traded companies back in 2000 and you only had I think the number was 1500 companies owned by private equity firms and now you've got 10,000 firms that are owned by private equity firms and you've only got 4,000 public That's companies cool. yeah. um, and I guess one of the one of the questions I have about that is there seems to be this sense that the federal government has an obligation to step in when the public markets are impacted. But if something were to happen in the private markets, that can kind of come and go and not sort of have government action. But it makes me think back to long term capital management and the impact that long term capital management had on the economy in the late yeah. 1990s, that while the federal government didn't mm -hmm. step in to prop up long term capital management, it had this ripple effect throughout the economy that really set off the dot com downturn. Is that is, should we be concerned about the, the, the private capital markets today like we were not concerned back in the late 1990s uh, as it relates to long term capital management? Yeah, you make a great point. I mean, I, I think the Fed and other Treasury, other regulators have the ability in the tools to address problems in the in the traditional banking system and in 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 terms of uh, uh, making sure that credit continues to flow through the through the banking system. They don't have the tools or even the ability legal or otherwise, in, uh, under most circumstances, to step in and help out uh, institutions in the in the shadow system, including providers of uh, in the private credit markets. So, it, it, and even if they wanted to, even if they felt like they had the legal right to, it's unclear how they would do that. It, it's complicated. It depends on, you know, market to market because of the dynamics. And they don't really have the clear understanding or the horses to really understand what's going on in all these different markets. I mean, I'll give you a sense, you know, uh, uh, an example, a sense of that, you know, the leveraged loan market, the private credit market, you know, 1.56 trillion in outstanding. I'd say about half of that, eight, 900 billion of that goes into CLOs. And there, that's pretty transparent, you know, because that, that debt is rated, you know, there's a lot of transparency around kind of the financials of the companies with that debt. But the other half of that, the other 800, 900 billion of that, we know nothing about. It's very, very opaque. We have no sense of the terms, uh, you know, the underwriting, the, the ownership, uh, the structure. And, uh, you know, that makes it much more scary, uh, nerve wracking, because you just don't know what you don't know. And again, how would the Fed step in and support that market if it went south in a big way? So I think that's you know a reasonable concern and issue. Now it's not like anything I'm saying is new to the Fed or FSOC. You know that's the, the folks that look at the system and scour it for these kind of vulnerabilities. They know all this, so that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is they don't know. I'm sure they they're scratching their heads uh, trying to figure out how to get their mind around it, measure it, and ultimately what to do about it if things do do go off the rails. So I do think this is a significant vulnerability that you know, again, uh, could manifest if the system remains under a lot of pressure, and it will if the Fed continues, has to continue to keep its foot on the brakes and the curve remains as inverted as it is for any length of time. You mentioned that we've got a jobs report coming out on Friday, Mark. Um, you've um, been very straightforward of focusing that the consumer is still very strong, and we can talk about the consumer in a moment, but as it relates to employment, in listening to some of your previous statements and reading some of your stuff, um, I, I think it's really interesting your take on the jobs market and why you think that 3.5, 3.6% unemployment is here to stay for quite some time. Yeah, I, I mean, it may rise a little bit, uh, Willie. I mean, I wouldn't be, if it went from three and a half to four, or a little over four, no big deal. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to what this unemployment rate is consistent with full employment and wage growth consistent with a 2% inflation target. So, you know, if you told me four, I don't know that I would argue, but I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, that I think we're, we're close to full employment. I don't think we're too far beyond full employment. I mean, the 3.56% unemployment rate that's been around for more than a year now is the same unemployment rate we had back before the pandemic for a year or two. And back then, we were worried about inflation being too low, well below the 2% inflation target. So 
why do we think three and a half or 3.6 percent unemployment today is an economy that's too tight or operating beyond beyond full employment? It feels like we're kind of roughly where we we need to be. If it eases up a little bit from here, that that's fine, no big deal. And again, that might help on the inflation front, but I don't know that we need to. Again, going back to my point, why raise interest rates? You know, if you know the economy is inflation is coming in, wage growth is moderating, all the trend lines look good, and and the economy isn't beyond full employment it is you know consistent with a, an economy that's operating you know where it should be operating around, around the mid threes. Uh, I will say, you know, I do think job growth will continue to moderate here. I do you know businesses are responding uh, to the higher interest rates and the softening in demand. They're not doing it by laying off workers. Uh, the layoff rates are low. They they picked up a little bit late last year, early this in the tech sector, but that, that's already settled down. And if you look at layoffs broadly, they remain very low. But they're, they're, the way they're adjusting, businesses are adjusting, is by reducing their hiring. Their hiring rates are starting to come in. And I, I think if that's the case, that's another reason to believe we'll be able to make through go through all this without a recession. Because I do think layoffs are critical to uh, uh, spooking investors going back to consumer confidence and causing investors to go into the bunker, it, you know, that, that only will happen if there's a significant increase in layoffs. And so far, that's not happening. And you've, you say that there is labor hoarding, I think is the term that you used, um, going on by corporations due to, um, A, a lack of immigration, um, B, boomer retirement, and, and C, just the, the need for labor, given that we're not going to go into a recession. And so I think one of the interesting things to me is you picked these two things out and identified them a while ago. In other words, while everyone else is saying we're going to go into a recession and there's increased joblessness is going to put downward pressure and that's going to hurt the economy and what have you, you said, no, we're not going to go into a recession. And in the process of that, companies are going to continue to hoard labor because it's so hard to go out and hire new labor. Um, how... How significant an issue is immigration reform to the U.S.? You know, we talked a moment ago, mm. Mark, about mm. the debt, and the debt's yeah. clearly something and you're putting out there. You know, you got kind of a ten-year trajectory to get your act together, or this actually does become a very significant issue. Um, but on the on on the immigration side of things, um, isn't it fair to say that given the current birth rates in the United States, if we don't do something? to get real immigration reform in place, to get legal immigrants coming into the United States at significant numbers, that the ability for this economy to continue to grow is under great, great pressure? Yeah, totally. I think uh, I think you, you, you nailed it. I mean, I do think businesses are what I call hoarding because they know their number one problem. And this is a problem, number one problem before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now and in the future will be finding workers and retaining workers. And this goes to just simple demographics, the aging out of the workforce by boomers, me, I'm aging out. Uh, people are retiring very quickly. And by the way, interestingly enough, since the pandemic hit, we're seeing a lot fewer retirees come back into the labor market. Historically, people retire and then they come back. This time, they're not coming back to nearly the same degree for lots of different potential reasons. But the other, as you point out, the other key demographic fact here is that immigration is under has been under pressure, certainly in part because of, of policy going back to uh, the Trump administration, and, and in part due to um, uh, global demographics, you know, uh, countries that uh, have seen their incomes rise and their economies do better, uh, their birth rates decline. And once birth rates fall below replacement rates, immigration stops. So for example, Mexico, we're not seeing many me people from Mexico come into our country because we're, the, the birth rates have declined in those countries. Um, and then of course the pandemic itself had an impact on immigration. So uh, immigration has been impaired and that's also significantly affecting you know, growth in the labor force and our ability to grow more quickly. The other thing about immigration that's really I think lost in a lot of the debate uh, is that immigrants are not only important in terms of uh, uh, worker, people working, but it's also very important to productivity growth that, uh, that uh, immigrants tend to be more entrepreneurial, uh, more risk taking. It's almost self-selection. You know, you don't pick up and leave one country and come to, to another country, even if it's the United States of America without being a risk taker. And so 
you do see a higher rate of business formation and innovation among companies that are, you know, uh, founded by and driven by uh, by immigrants. So I think immigration is really, and of course, it's it's the the other point I'd make quickly about immigration is it's really uh, vexing our politics. You know, one of the reasons why we we are, we seem to be kind of fracturing politically is around this issue of immigration and it, for good reason you know the the, the immigrant immigration uh, creates a lot of tensions uh reasonably so in 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 border parts of the country and and you can see it's now spreading to different parts of the country so this is you know an issue we need to uh, address and i think if we there's no better policy that we could implement to improve our growth rate underlying growth rate more quickly and more significantly than uh, improving, uh, reforming our immigration policy to allow for more immigrants, more skilled immigrants, but you know we need skilled and unskilled, but you know making it a more rational policy, uh, 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 I think nothing would go further to helping our long-term growth prospects than, than doing that. So at the beginning of this year, when lots of people were calling for a recession and now it seems um, easy for people to say, okay, we're gonna maybe have a soft landing here. I mean we all have to keep in mind that there were plenty, plenty, plenty of people who a year ago were clearly saying we're headed for a massive recession. Um, and then even as recently as a month ago, people were still saying, you know, we're still headed towards a recession. Now all of a sudden the tune has changed, but well over six months ago, you were out there saying, I think we avoided a recession in the U S for, for five reasons. One of them was that labor issue about labor hoarding. The second excess savings with the inside the consumer light household, um, debt load, um, anchored inflation expectations, and low oil. Um, let's, for a moment, just the, the consumer mark is still very healthy as it relates to two things. One, savings, and B, overall debt load. Take that, and if you would, tie it into fixed rate mortgages and how important the refi wave that just happened on the single family side is to the overall balance sheet of the U.S. consumer. Yeah, that's been very important. Uh uh, you know, obviously, people have refied down into the previously record low interest rates. I mean, hard to believe, but the thirty-year fix, I think, got down to what two six, two seven, something like that, in kind of late twenty twenty-one, right before the Fed started jacking up interest rates. And of course, that set off a massive. Well, we had a series of massive refinancing waves. That was uh, particularly massive. And so, I think the average coupon on existing single-family mortgages is about three and a half percent. Uh, and they're locked in. And so, and, you know, in fact, if you look across all household debt, mortgages, auto, student loans, cards, consumer finance, the whole shoot and match, only about 10% of the debt uh, has interest rates that adjust within one year of a change in market rate. So the household, the American household is very well insulated from this run-up in interest rates. So their debt, their so-called debt service burden that's the proportion of their after-tax income that they must uh, pay to uh, remain current on that debt uh, is about at a 50-year low, uh, you know, very, very low, and not, and not rising again because people have locked in those uh, those low rates. So that's uh, really been very helpful. It's also one of the biggest distinctions between our economy and everywhere else in the world. Uh, it varies a lot, but if you look. In other developed economies like uh, in um, in Europe or Canada or Australia or New Zealand, uh, and certainly in emerging markets, their debt is much more short-term debt and it adjusts more quickly. So they're much more; those economies are much more at risk or more sensitive to the run-up in interest rates because uh, it translates through in terms of those debt payments a lot more quickly. Let me jump in with a quick question for you on that one. Is it fair to say that the holding on to the line that the United States of America is built on the 30 year fixed rate mortgage for the reason why Fannie and Freddie should have been taken into conservatorship and remain in conservatorship today is actually, as you look at it in hindsight, exceedingly important to the fundamentals of this economy today. And one of the reasons why it's performing the way it is. It, it is, it is though, it is interesting. I mean, all, what you're doing, what we're doing as a nation is we're transferring the interest rate risk from the household to the financial system, right? So the risks are in just in a different place. Overseas, it's in the household sector. Here, it's in the in the financial sector. That's worked out great for us 
in the current context, in large part because Fannie and Freddie are in conservatorship uh, and we've managed, you know, the interest rate, you know, in the obviously in the post GFC world, there's been a lot of changes to Fannie and Freddie. So they're much less risky. And also, given all of the regulatory changes since the GFC, the great financial crisis, to uh, liquidity and capital, you know, banks have done a much better job managing that interest rate. They haven't managed it perfectly. SVB blew up, but it's certainly a lot better than it was. So, uh, you know, we've all, what we've done is we've said, okay, the financial system is in a better spot to digest the interest rate risk than the household sector. And in the current, again, in the current context, in the current business cycle, that's worked out marvelously for us for a lot of, you know, uh, you know, the idiosyncratic reasons that I mentioned before. But it's, it's, you know, we have had our scrapes with, you know, interest rate risk doing a lot of damage. I mean, there was the GFC, there was the SNL crisis, you know, so, you know, it, 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 it's, there's no free lunch. Uh, you know, the, 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 you can't get rid of the risk. Uh, you just got to decide where, where it's going to go and how you, how you manage it and how you mitigate it if it, if it blows up. So let's touch on energy for a moment, and then I want to go to housing because of that final. The, this is a great segue for us to go to housing, but I want to tick off on the one other reason that you put out there on why we wouldn't go into a recession, which is oil. Yeah. Um, oil last July was at 110 a barrel. Um, I've, I've said a couple of times, I read a, I read a truest analyst report in July of last year that said that oil was headed to 160 bucks a barrel. And it was a pretty convincing piece. Um, fortunately, <laughs> dead wrong. Um, <laughs> And uh, and today we sit at seventy nine bucks a barrel, and I guess there, there there are two questions I have there, Mark. How important to the overall inflationary outlook is that energy cost oil input? And second of all, do you have confidence that oil stays in a sort of band of where it is today, or do you think that we could find ourselves in a much higher energy cost environment going forward for whatever reasons, whether it is the Ukraine war and supply shortages coming out of Russia um, or anything else that plays into that picture? Well, you know, oil prices are one of those things I forecast where I, uh, my confidence is not so much. <laughs> 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 that is a tough one because there's so many moving parts that are, you know, not driven by economics they're driven by, you know, geopolitical dynamics. Russia is, is at kind of at the top of the list. What, what OPEC particularly what Saudi decides to do, you know, what's going on with China and COVID policy. So there's a lot of moving parts here. I will say that I am expecting oil prices to settle in between 80 and $90 a barrel, WTI on the low side, Brent on the high side. So we're kind of sort of there. And I've been expecting it for a while. I mean, China, uh, the economy has been softer and we haven't seen as much demand and that's kept prices down for longer than I anticipated. But you know, now feels like we're you know migrating up. So eighty to ninety, if if that's uh, if we stay there over the next 12, 18 months, certainly not go over that to any significant degree for any length of time, we're golden. You know, I'm you know I'm confident about inflation. I'm confident that the Fed will end its rate hikes. That uh, that we will get through without recession. Uh, if prices jump though back closer to hundred dollars, or certainly if they go over hundred dollars, that means that. The, the cost of a gallon of regular unleaded is going to go from three bucks seventy five, which is where we are today, to four four fifty. If we get back to one twenty five barrel uh, oil, that's five bucks. If that happens, uh, then we're done. Uh, you know, and uh, I think it's going to suck the wind out of the consumer. Confidence it will fall. Uh, the Fed will likely continue to raise rates to try to keep inflation expectations down. And we're going into recession. So if there's one thing that makes me that I'm most nervous about most immediately, there's and I worry about lots of things, you know, financial system, we potential government shutdown, you know, student loan. There's, you know, there's a long list. The one thing I worry about the most, because it ha can happen so fast and it's so unpredictable, is you know, the price of oil fall, fall out. The, here's the other thing. It's not only the price of oil, it's about, you know, refineries, right? I mean, one thing we're seeing now, one reason why we're paying $3.75 at $80 oil is because the heat has caused all kinds of problems for the refining uh, sector and it's it just crack spreads are gapping out. And, you know, I, I had this nightmare, uh, Willie, that that we're going to have a Cat 5 hurricane. First of all, it goes over my home in Florida. That's the first thing right. I will do. Then it goes into the Gulf and hits the coast of Texas and wipes out a refinery. That 
that would be a pro that would be very problematic. You know, then you could see you know prices that are are, are are you know at a point where we might go in recession. So that's the one thing where I'm not as confident in where I think the risks are you know most significant. The, that it's the oil price. Um, you mentioned really quickly uh, the student debt repayment uh, number a trillion five of student debt outstanding. The Biden administration had put forth a forgiveness program that was going to add a huge amount to the federal government's indebtedness, if you will, um, to the tune of about a half a trillion dollars. That was obviously um, uh, voted down by the Supreme Court. Uh, we're coming back online. We're at the end of August. Consumers need to start repaying their student loans after the forgiveness, the forbearance program that was put in place around COVID. Um, you don't think that that's that big an issue, do you? I don't. You know, I think um, if you do the arithmetic and all the student loan borrowers started repaying and didn't have resources and had to cut back the same amount on everything else they were spending their money on, it's about $70, $75 billion. Uh, not, not inconsequential, certainly not for them, but it's, it's, not, it's not a dagger in the heart, I don't think. But the Biden administration also just recently through executive order said to servicers of those loans not to report a delinquent student loan borrower to the bureaus. So there's no penalty to a borrower if they don't pay. And so I suspect many will not until they have to, which at this point is a year from now, which may be extended again, you know, who knows. And then the other thing is many of those- Sorry, How can they do that? In other words, like aren't rating, isn't, isn't credit rating, isn't your FICO score just it's calculated in the private sector. The, the concept that the Biden administration would say you can't report that data. It, it, isn't there a lawsuit coming along to say, no, we want fair and accurate data on our consumers and that needs to be reported? Uh, yeah, uh, there, I'm sure there'll be lawsuits. There always is. I, I will say this was the same. We did this with the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. Uh, anyone who was delinquent on... Uh, uh, any kind of credit, they could not be reported to the bureaus. And in fact, that did create a lot of problems around score inflation, which is a whole other you know, issue or story. Uh, I think in this case, they have more significant legal standing. And I'm not a lawyer, but listening to the lawyers, because this is, uh, uh, you know, th these are government loans and they can service them anytime, any way they want. And part of the, you know, uh, program allows them to adjust these these terms uh, to their servicers and, and they're just exercising that right uh, in terms of their agreements with the servicers. But I'm sure there'll be lawsuits, but by the time they're adjudicated, you know, I don't, I, my point is, I don't think we're going to see 70, $75 billion in payments uh, come yeah. October. I got it. Um, let's shift to housing for a moment, because as you have talked about, us not hitting a recession as it relates to the overall economy. Um, you've also said we're in a full bore um, housing recession right now, and that the only thing that is going to end that recession is that housing becomes more affordable. Um, I've got a I've got a quick slide that I want my team to throw up on the on the on the on the screen if I can. Um, that is from Zellman uh, that they sent across to me this morning. And th this slide I find to be fascinating, Mark, because as you can see here, the, 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 the purple at the bottom uh, is the number of homes, this is new home sales, under $300,000. And you can see that you, know, you only need to go back to you know, 2010, 2011, when over 70% of new homes were being sold for a price point under $300,000. And as you can see over the last decade, new homes being supplied to the market have just gone up and up and up as it relates to that price point where they're coming in. We can pull this slide back down. Um, it's, made, it's made the point I wanted to make. Yeah, cool. But with, with your point about mortgages and a 3.5% mortgage, the existing inventory isn't going to come on the market because anyone who would sell their home today loses a 3.5% mortgage and has to flip into a 6 to 6.5% 6 mortgage. So you're not getting a supply of old inventory. I just showed very clearly where the home builders are building, which is at a, at a a very unattainable price point for the average American. So what's the net net here? Because you're very clear in saying until we get this affordability issue taken care of in housing, which is a supply issue, and supplies are being constrained for lots of different reasons, until that happens, we're going to stay in a housing crisis in America. 
Yeah, and uh, existing home sales, existing home sales are very low. They're kind of pandemic low, GFC low. And I don't see them coming back unless in any meaningful way, unless affordability is restored. And that requires mortgage rates to come down, incomes to rise, and or house prices to, to decline. And I suspect we'll see some combination of all three things. New home sales have held up better because builders have effectively cut price. I mean, their effective prices have, have actually come down 10, 15%, you know, because of all the incentives they're providing, interest rate buy-down being the most notable. Uh, uh, they just uh, are subsidizing a much lower int uh, initial interest rate for a year or two or three. So they've effectively cut price. And that's why the new home market has held up a lot better than the existing market, at least so far. Uh, but I do think we do need to see, and I do expect mortgage rates to come in a little bit. I mean, I, right now, the 30-year fix, last I looked, was close to seven. If I'm right about 10-year yields, long run being around four, that suggests the 30-year fix on average should be five and a half, five and three quarters. So I expect some of that. I don't expect a recession. So I do expect some improvement in incomes. But even with that, I do expect house prices to come in a bit. And I think the the way this works is it's a slow grind. It's not a cliff event because people don't want to sell uh, at their home with a three and a half percent mortgage. But at some point, they will have to sell. Life happens. Divorce, uh, death, children, job change. And they can hold off selling for a while, but they can't hold off selling forever. And over time... Those life events will build up. We'll see more people putting homes on the on the market and transactions will occur and those transactions will occur, occur at a lower price. Now, I'm not, I don't ex expect big price declines, but if you told me peak to trough prices are down five, six, seven, eight percent over the next two, three years nationwide, I'd say, okay, that sounds about right to me, you know, something like that. And if you get, you know, incomes, household incomes rising four or five percent and you get mortgage rates down to five and a half, five and three quarters, then we get affordability back to something that's more workable and we'll start to see those existing home sales start to come back up again, origination volume starting to come back up again. But I do think we need some price declines. But given that slow grind, what then does that mean for the multifamily industry? My, as I hear you walk through that, um, supply of new single family homes at a price point that is thoroughly unaffordable for most renters, existing inventory not being put out on the market, therefore, that lower price point inventory isn't up for sale, therefore not available to renters. Um, I sit there and hear that and I say, renters aren't gonna be able to, if you will, move from rental housing into for sale housing, therefore occupancy levels stay high in multifamily and therefore we do get rents moving again from where they are right now, which is basically flat across the country. Um, and that in 2024 and 2025, um, multifamily rents are going to start to move again. Yeah, I think that's right on the demand side. I think, uh, you know, for uh, affordability is in the single family market is, the, you know, it's not non-existent. So that does, renters can't, can't afford single family homes. Of course, rents are high given the surge in rents previously. So they can't save, they're having a hard time saving as well to for that down payment they need. So I do think that means the home ownership rate, the percent of the population that owns their own home that's peaked. I don't, you know, we've got a data point today, uh, Willie, it's 65.9%. So I think that's the high water mark, you know, around two thirds. So I think on the demand side, you're right. I think though, there's supply coming. Uh, I think there's more supply. I mean, if you look at the amount of multifamily units in the pipeline going to completion, it's close to a million units. That's a record by orders of magnitude. Got all bottled up because of the pandemic, going back to my earlier point about why we have high inflation pandemic messed with supply chains and labor markets couldn't build couldn't get multifamily units across the finish line and i'm saying stuff you know better than i but that will happen and as we get more supply and most of it is i think uh, is probably more in the high end of the market as opposed to the affordable you know workforce housing but at the high end so in big downtown areas big cities like philly i there's a a lot of multifamily units that are in train coming to completion and I think that that's where you're going to see the continued rent weakness, uh, you know, going forward. But on in terms of workforce, you know, affordable rental. Yeah, you're right. I think and if you make the distinction between lifestyle rental versus rent by necessity, it's, it's, I think lifestyle rental is under pressure compared to, you know, uh, uh, rent by necessity. And Mark, we, we've talked about a lot here. We've talked about housing. We've talked about the consumer. We've talked about energy. 
Um, we've talked about mortgage rates. We've talked about Fed policy and where rates are going. As you look across the landscape right now, and given that you have been very prescient over the last year about some things that a lot of people are concerned about that haven't materialized, as you look out and say, okay, you know, August 2nd of 2024, if we had this conversation then, what's the, what's the outlier, if you will, in the analysis? I, I thought your comment about energy and about a hurricane that comes through and knocks out a rig in the Gulf of Mexico is a really interesting one as it relates to the sensitivity that we have there as it relates to energy input and energy costs. Um, but beyond that, anything else that you're focused on that says, you know, there's a there's a weakness here. It sounds like the banking sector isn't something that you're terribly concerned about unless we, you know, stay higher for significantly longer or they keep tightening uh, to it to a degree that you're not projecting right now. What else? What's the what, what's the outlier? We, you don't think student debt is something that we really have to worry about right now. What's the what, what's the what's the curveball that you are focused on trying to get your arms around that people ought to be focusing on at this point? Well, uh, I think the next the thing that uh, may uh, nail us here is the government shutdown. Uh, that uh, high probability there will be a shutdown come October 1st, which is the start of the federal fiscal year. Uh, you need a house to agree to a budget and uh, the incentives at this point are not to do that. There are a lot of house Republicans that are pretty angry at the debt limit deal. They don't feel like they got the spending cuts that they wanted. And they're going to try to get those cuts via uh, the budget process and and use the government a government shutdown as leverage. There is a uh, in the Treasury debt limit deal. There was an agreement that if they uh, lawmakers can't come to terms, there will be a one percent across the board cut to all discretionary spending January first, twenty twenty four. One percent is pretty significant, and it's both to non defense and defense. And the thought was that would be kind of a forcing mechanism to get people to agree because. Democrats don't want cuts to non-defense. Republicans don't want cuts to defense. So there will be an agreement come January 1. But that means there's a fourth quarter, we could have a, a government that's not operating. And that by itself, if you do the arithmetic, that could be over a percent of GDP in a time when GDP is already going to be pretty weak because of the Fed tightening and everything that's going on. I'm not saying you know, I think we can get through without a recession, but I don't. I don't know that it's going to be easy. It's going. To, I don't know if soft landing is a good description of what we're going to experience. But if you throw in a government shutdown, you know that could be a problem. Particularly if you get to January one and they can't come to terms, you get a one percent cut. That you know that's a that's going to be really an issue. Student loan debt's not an issue by itself, but you now have government shutdown, student loan issue. You have banks tightening credit. You got oil prices moving north. You know, I can construct a recession scenario pretty quickly if I if I have a government shutdown that lasts more than a few weeks. And I, I think just I'm here in D.C. today. I'm sitting in D, an office in D.C. today, listening to what you know the conversation. Uh, it's um, you know that's a real possibility. It's interesting. Though. I think the the last time the federal government shut down was when Speaker Boehner was um, Speaker of the House and. I think we were shut down for 13 days and it the calculation was the tens of billions of dollars that cost our economy to be shut down for those 13 days. I, I certainly hope that those that are focused on the continued growth of the economy and um, avoiding any type of recession understand how much of a negative impact a government shutdown could have on us. I think you should run for office. Willie. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. How we need uh, you. I uh, on on that note, on that note, Mark, we, we they, our our conversations. I I contribute. I would. I would just put up a website. I contribute. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, it's always great to see you. You're so insightful on the markets. Um, I uh, very much look forward to getting together in person sometime soon. Yeah, and thank great. you very much for giving us an hour of your time and talking through. Um, these markets that we're working our way through better, I think, than many people expected other than you. Um, and uh, it's it's Thank great you. to have gone back and looked at some of the things you've said over the last year and how many of those things came to fruition. So um, I hope we avoid a government shutdown and I hope all your other thoughts as it relates to what's material and not material come to pass. Well, you're very kind. And I really, again, appreciate your friendship and your support and look forward to the conversation a year or two down the road. So hopefully I'm at least half right. Mark, it's great to see you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye.